The purpose of the next hour is, uh, it's less than an hour actually, is to synthesize the conversations from the breakout groups, to hear back from what has happened in, in the groups, uh, and uh, really also identify uh, areas of, of potential collaboration as we move forward. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are many opportunities here to connect the dots. And there is, of course, uh, no one who could do a better job than uh, Carolina to guide us through this exercise, tie things together. Carolina is one of my all-time favorite Berkman Fellows, a former Berkman Fellow, is, of course, well known to all of you. And it's just delightful to have you back on campus. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this session. We will end at 11.30 sharp. Um, we'll then please uh, cluster again in, in the clusters uh, that um, we've been working together over the past few days. Uh, and we'll then walk over and we will give specific instructions to another building so that you uh, also see another part of the Harvard Law School campus for lunch as well as cluster meetings. But more on that uh, later on. Um, with that, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, hi everybody, good morning. I, f I hope everybody had some breakfast today. Uh, I still see some fruits there, so maybe that's one of your last times to uh, be healthy this morning and have some fruits. Uh, I want to thank Earth and the Berkman Center and, and Halle Foundation for putting this together and um, thanks for trusting me the job of the moderation of the session. Uh, I want to call up on, first we're going to do a 15-20 minutes report on the breakout sessions uh, so we, we can learn from our uh, uh, fellows that were in other groups, how the discussions went there. So I would uh, first call up on Ronaldo Lemos that uh, moderated the international panel, and then we're going to move forward uh, to uh, Jen and also Justin Reich, and who coordinated the informal group. And then if you also could report five minutes. So Ronaldo, if you could come up here. And if the other uh, reporters could come and sit closer here so we, we can move faster to you guys uh, soon. Thank you, Carol. Actually, this is a very hard task to be the first. I didn't have the time to sum up everything. We had a very good uh, discussion about so many items. We had descriptions about uh, the OER policies and situation in countries like New Zealand, South Africa, uh, Mali, uh, Brazil, and so many others. I cannot go through all of them. But I would like to get you some of the points that were raised in the discussion. So for instance, uh, one of the first points is that sometimes money is actually available in some developing countries in order to build resources for educational materials, not necessarily for OER, and sometimes not really uh, attached to good policies. So one of the challenges is actually how do you play the issue of uh, getting better policies at the state level and also like how civil society is also a, a very important component for that to happen. Another thing that we heard uh, is also about uh, initiatives, for instance, the Open Data Initiative in Kenya, which is not really uh, specifically within the def definition of open educational resources. And actually, when we discussed that, that actually raised the issue between uh, a sort of a distinction between open educational resources and open educational connections. What is the difference? Should we focus on content production or should we focus on other forms of like creating new forms of learning, of connection between the students and professors. And I think that was basically one of the pervasive issues that ran out through all the, the discussions that we had. So we had like descriptions of what is going on in New Zealand, for instance, and the open access license initiative that was is happening there, but not really extended to the tertiary education situation. We also talked about institutional resistance. So you have like sometimes publishers resisting 
OER and other sorts of challenges. And another very important point that was raised, and I think it's especially interesting considering the case of Brazil, which is sometimes the government doesn't really understand in full what's going on in terms of open educational resources. And sometimes that's a good thing. So we discussed the issue of the Secretary of uh, Education of Sao Paulo, which did a very interesting and comprehensive open educational resources program. But then when it was accomplished, he confessed that he was glad he didn't really examine all the details because if he had, he wouldn't pass, have passed it. So basically he said, oh, I'm glad that I did it. Now I understand how complicated it could have been if I really had understood the whole thing. And so sometimes that is a, a good thing in, in the case of Sao Paulo. He was glad and actually when he, he adopted the program, now he's pushing for a new legislation to be approved, actually mandating the same sort of thing for the future as well. So. Uh, one of the, the final questions that we had, I'm not going to take much of the time, was actually a very good question coming from a colleague from Mali, and she basically said, but what happens in countries uh, where you don't really have the infrastructure to enjoy OER? So for instance, you don't have access to computers, people they type slowly, they don't have really the resources that are necessary to enjoy the benefits of OER. And that was basically one of the final comments that we had. And my comment was that basically I, I, I wished it had been the first comment we had like in our session because that is uh, an, another very important issue that is unresolved but I think has to be dealt with as well. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, just to finish, this is just a brief summary. We talked much more about this. And we had an excellent uh, scribe that was Alicia. She took like very comprehensive notes about the session. So I wonder if anybody's interested in a detailed description, she can certainly make them available. They are very good notes. Thanks. Thank you, Ronaldo. Um, so should I call up uh, Justin to report? Hello. Um, so let me, here's the brief summary. We were talking about domestic context, which I think we primarily interpreted as uh, um, state and national domestic policy kinds of issues. So I would say that we had um, three ideas and two threats um, that would probably summarize our conversation. Um, certainly the idea of supporting open policy, which Cable described really eloquently yesterday at the state level and the federal level is kind of the um, the big no-brainer idea that we didn't talk about because we all agreed with it. Um, but we thought about sort of two complementary pieces to that. Um, one is, is that, um, uh, you know, that, that education is famous for having a decoupling between educator practice and uh, district, state, federal policy. Um, and so um, complementing open policy with some kind of uh, uh, national efforts around teacher professional development related to OER and deeper learning and those kinds of things is really critical. Um, especially given that the, I mean, the landscape of professional development right now is essentially the publishers are providing um, the vast majority of professional development and then there's kind of a hodgepodge of other institutions and of course districts and schools provide a lot of their own internal professional development. Um, but uh, um, so thinking about how can we have, um, you know, what, what I think we didn't get, I, I think that we identified that as a need more than an idea. Um, but there are definitely a lot of people here who are doing professional development kinds of things. I know that Hewlett just made a, a recent uh, grant to the Buck Institute of Education and Alfred is here from there and he's uh, thinking a lot about um, providing, you know, scaling up professional development around project-based learning. And so that would be an interesting strand um, to have developed in this community is make sure that all the people who do professional development stuff um, have opportunities to get in a room with one another and come up with the idea that we didn't finish coming up with. Um, and then another idea that came out um, was to um, have, you know, one of the things that we actually don't know enough about is what do, what do investments in learning resources look like um, and as a, as a way to, to lever um, institutions to rethink some of this, um, what if there was funding for 
one of the three major auditing agencies like PricewaterhouseCooper um, to go to a national sample of districts and institutions of higher ed um, and audit uh, in a pretty formal way their, um, their investments in learning resources and try to figure out. Um, so exactly how are they investing those learning resources and to what extent can we understand what kinds of outcomes they're getting from those learning resources with the idea that, uh, um, that, that auditing um, can bring about compliance and change in a kind of stick-like, bludgeon-like fashion. Um, so fund some bludgeoners. Um, and then two threats that we talked about um, were um, one, you know, thinking about as there's more, both related to the sort of momentum of OER. Um, so if there's a shift from proprietary, more expensive resources to less expensive OER resources, um, to what extent can we support institutions in thinking about how do we make sure that that's not simply conceived of as savings to go to healthcare and pension funds, but that that money can continue to be preserved um, for different kinds of learning purposes, whether it's professional development or tablets or other kinds of things. And there's actually really good exemplars in this community, like at the Louise Baywaters and the Leadership Public Schools of how in their shift to CK-12 textbooks, they preserved the funding that was going into those textbooks for professional development. But seeing that as a real kind of potential threat um, to, to look at and trying to think about, you know, what are the level, you know, what are the, the federal, state, and district level levers that you can pull to make sure that um, if there are cost savings that are associated with OER, they're, they're, they get moved to learning opportunities um, and not to other things. Um, and then the second one was actually thinking towards um, the uh, election in November and thinking about, you know, sort of we've had a lot of momentum behind OER. Um, what does a change of administration look like? Um, I think it's not very difficult to, to imagine st stories that you can tell um, about OER um, that are that, that, uh, that democratic ears are pretty sympathetic to, um, but, but we were sort of conceiving of two kinds of storylines um, that conservative thinkers might think about OER. Um, one, you might imagine the sort of Tea Party perspective of like, this saves money, this is about government efficiency, like this is totally great, you know, this is a nonpartisan, bipartisan sort of issue. Um, the other storyline that you might be able to tell would be something like, um, here is you know, the, the state control government kind of um, using federal funds to put proprietary businesses out of business and to select for um, schools and institutions you know, what kinds of government mandated materials they have to use. Um, and this is a, uh, um, you know, looks more like a socialist plot um, than a um, government efficiency kind of program. Um, and so really think, uh, something that I'm really interested in, but that, that uh, Although then that was my idea, um, that, that I think has come up a few times is this sort of idea of marketing, branding, and thinking about, you know, um, if we want, um, as Kathy said, you know, open to be to the education movement as the word green is to the environmental movement, you know, what does that mean? Thank you very much, Justine. Uh, could I call? The, uh, the note there on two is, is the, the auditing is not in about investment in OER, it's about uh, learning just uh, educational resources. Like what's the current state of the use of... You say use or investment, I understood. Investment. Justin, can you correct that on, can you report on that? Number two, does that translate what you were explaining to us? Investments, what if... How are they, I don't know, we probably disagree about what use and investment means, but like how are they spending their money? Exactly, yeah, it's the flow resources. of money on purchasing and developing, right? So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and Karen, could you join us to report on the informal group? Thank you. So we had a very um, stimulating and spirited conversation about informal learning, and I think there was a lot of um, enthusiasm about informal environments as a vehicle for disruption and innovation that we're all excited about. Um, we talked about informal learning as a way to bridge gaps, both from a learner perspective, gaps maybe in learning readiness, in affordability, pacing as a way to individualize and, and differentiate in ways that sometimes is more difficult to do in formal settings. Um, we had some very good examples of informal learning acting as a bridge and also bringing the informal elements into a formal setting. So some of those examples were the Bridge to Success program in the UK, 
um, Western Governors, um, High Tech High, um, Esther's work at Palo Alto High School, and then one that we didn't we we sort of mentioned but didn't talk a lot about, but I think is a real um, a big area for this are the MOOCs, where you know there's a sort of a hybrid model um, that David Wiley was certainly a pioneer in in the early days of having a a formal university class that's, that is credit and face-to-face, -face, but then sort of opening that up to a much larger um, group of people who are um, learning in an informal way and sort of that as a really a way to bridge the two areas. Um, and then we, we concluded with a great discussion about badges, which I know is of interest to a lot of people. And we had reflections on everything from that badges should be primarily have meaning to the learner and be a source of fun and motivation to badges as a as a new kind of transcript which was a really that was a, that was useful to me to sort of frame it that way and then all the way to badges as a better system of accreditation and i'm going to just turn it over to um carla from mozilla just for a minute to talk more about badges because i think that's that's a big topic, and she is the queen of badges. <laughs> Frightening. Um, okay, hi everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Carla Casilli. I'm with Mozilla Foundation. We are with um, we are the people behind the Open Badges work. And um, just to give you an idea, badges can actually be used in lots of different versions. And right now, we were focusing on how they might be used in representing informal learning in um, informal settings and tying that back to the idea of how do you bring that back into formal. And there are lots of ways to do that. But um, badges offer, offer an opportunity to do for any issuer to provide their values kind of not only to the people who are learning from them but also to the general public and uh, I could go on for a very long time but I <laughs> don't want to right now um, so that we can keep the conversation moving but I'm happy to have the conversation with anybody about the use of badges um, and in particular I just want to look at some of my notes that I took during um, the conversation that we just had so um, there's a, some outstanding questions that people have about badges, like how do you know that the person who is getting the badge has been doing the learning? And I think that's actually an outstanding question for any kind of learning, except for people who show up and it's the face time that people get um, in class. Um, and then, um, so David also mentioned that badges are a credential, and that's probably the best and simplest way to think about them, is that from a standpoint that they um, can produce a transcript. They can be, be a very granular transcript instead of the kind of the overarching thing that a lot of people have to rely on right now, which are degrees and certificates. So can we start to move down into smaller levels of understanding of what people are good at? And can students start to, students and learners, um, because it's, uh, really the concept of lifelong learning, can people start to use them in ways that represent um, not only when they're in academic environments, but also when they're outside of that? And can they start to be tied together so that you can see not only the learning that's happening within traditional academic institutions, but also all of the learning that's related to that is that in some ways sometimes is tangential, but can be the thing that leads people to getting better jobs, being good community members. Um, so badges are possible uh, to be able to use not only um, general representations of knowledge, but also associations, affiliations. Um, they can be used to represent soft skills, not just necessarily do you understand all of JavaScript, but are you a good mentor? Are you a good JavaScript mentor? Are you a good community member? So I'm going to wrap up there. <laughs> Um, so, where is Jean now to report in the last, okay. Um, so we're gonna pass now to the formal for five minutes and then we're gonna open the discussion and if anybody else feels that there is something we missed here, uh, you should just raise your hand and participate and we're gonna get uh, to that soon, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Okay, so in our formal session, we discussed K through 12 education and we also discussed higher education. We discussed um, the use of textbooks and why it's taking so long to move away from textbooks. Um, we spoke about um, administrations and policymakers who, um, have, who have been slow to um, implement the kinds of changes that would encourage teachers, incentivize <coughs> teachers to um, look at um, OER, to consider OER, to develop uh, their own teaching materials. Um, and we discussed that there actually are not only 
inadequate incentives by and large for teachers, um, but in addition to that, there are really disincentives for teachers that um, if you look at scholarship, that teachers are re not rewarded for developing educational materials for their students by and large. They're rewarded for other kinds of writing. Um, and teachers lose time if they're going outside of textbooks, moving away from textbooks and developing their own curriculum. So we discussed a system that's really a very <coughs> slow system. And of course, there are many exceptions all around the country and many people here who run incredible programs at both the K through 12 level and also at the university level. But that by and large, um, when you look at, at state systems, it's very, very slow for change. When you look at university systems, it's very slow for change. Um, we, we had people in the room who came from all different perspectives. Um, so we had someone in the room who talked about his school um, offering teachers an incentive. It was a $15,000 incentive, $5,000 per teacher, to have three teachers collaborate on what would be an online um, textbook that would be available to students, and that that experiment really failed. That basically it was not a sufficient incentive to get teachers to either um, step up in the first place or to follow through on that challenge. So there was this question about how, how can teachers be properly incentivized in a more widespread way to develop materials and also to um, use materials that are already online. Then we had a, a, a you know, very vigorous discussion about whether it's even necessary for teachers to be the ones who are developing the instructional materials and to what extent are the materials already existing online, to what extent are there alternative approaches, to what extent should students be playing a much more active role in finding information online and in bringing information to the classroom. Um, so we had a great deal of discussion about that. Um, we also talked about um, that, there are, that there, are certain, um, there are certain drivers that are in place or being set up that are going to help to encourage change. Cost is obviously a huge factor, and that's something that students are going to be increasingly conscious of, that um, school systems are going to be increasingly conscious of, that universities are increasingly conscious of. So that should help to reduce costs and to get people to move away from, um, from more traditional uh, materials. And we also talked about the Green Movement and, and student interest in that in particular and teacher interest as well and, and states as being another um, driver that will help to promote change. But I would say that there was a certain amount of probably frustration um, and a, a collective experience within the group that change is very slow to happen and um, that it's, you know, while it's in the works, it's going to take quite a while. So thank you very much for the reporters, and I just now want to get back to the audience, but also I want to uh, uh, give up uh, uh, my summary of what I've been hearing here, and and then um, go back back to you. So I think one of the was very funny when we heard in our group in the international uh, breakout session the question at the end, but how do we start? And I think all of us, we are all the time asking ourselves how to start or how to keep moving this process. And then we identify a new element and we think how to start, right? And I think we are really, uh, we always need to remember that we all of here are part of a broader ecosystem, right? A broader ecosystem that have its own declarations already has, for example, the Cape Town Declaration on Open Education, right? It really provides us a broader ecosystem to understand the role of each of us in this broader movement or ecosystem since we did so many analyses, uh, analogies with the Green Movement. Um, and I think we all should recognize the value of each of the stakeholders presented here and really learn what are our convergences and where we can collaborate. And from all the presentations here, I, I heard some very important topics. I, have, I heard about technology, right? How we take the infrastructure that we need to foster uh, the access to open educational resources. Uh, how we move that forward through mobile, through internet access, uh, and how we, uh, we, we work together with countries that are doing the leap from uh, no technology to having tablets in the classroom, right? How, how we insert OER already in that movement, right? How we help to design that 
taking uh, OER into consideration. Uh, and the professional development, I think, has a pretty important point there. Uh, another topic here were the case studies, right? We all have projects and we are learning from these experiences. And so I, I really think that how each of us started uh, uh, back can really provide inputs for people that want to start now. So it's great that we are all in the same room and I, I hope you enjoy this moment to, to, to rethink how to start. Uh, the other topic that appeared uh, international but also uh, domestic is the policy issue, right? How we provide and develop policies and how we understand the flow of uh, economic investment into OER and how uh, into educational resources and how we transform that investment to move forward to OER. And uh, we also heard a lot of about institutional change, right? And how formal can converge with informal through some systems and some new incentive systems and how we can collaborate to bring this innovation and this disruption from outside the system to inside the system and how everybody can gain with that. And, uh, and least but not last, I think uh, we are all here thinking about incentives, right? And this happened in many other movements, right? Happening the open access movement, hap is happening the open data movement, happening the, the free software movement. We all have to rethink our incentive systems to really move forward institutional and the formal environment, uh, open those environments to this disruption coming from uh, 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 the informal setting. Um, so I just want to get back to you and, and uh, really congratulate all of you to these amazing pieces that all of you are putting forward, or all of us are putting forward in this ecosystem, and ask if any of you have any comment to complement our notes, uh, but also to discuss some of our notes. I think we have a, a, a homework here that Helen and Berkman has put to all of us to find areas of collaboration, right? And uh, there is, I think, a big area here that is research about a lot of that, uh, research on incentives, research on the, the, the flow of capital, uh, research on how to improve the curriculum of professional development and so on. So if you could, after the summary, point us new forms that we could collaborate on moving forward, it would be great. What do you think uh, we still need? How should we start about what we still need? So, anybody? I'm going to call out of the blue if you, nobody raises their hands. Wayne, thank you, Wayne. Let me. Uh, do we have other microphones? Oh, okay, there it is. Is the microphone not yet? I'm not sure if this is in direct response to your question, hmm. but I'm reflecting back to the high level logic model that Hewlett presented, that Cathy presented at the beginning of the meeting. And if we think about the long-term impact and the long-term outcomes uh, around how do we mainstream OER within our institutions, and in relation to the question which we've been asked here, what are the key variables that might lead us closer to that ultimate aim? And I think one of the key variables and the, uh, something very practical we can do from within the formal sector to actually get to that point is around the formal accreditation of learning that is based entirely on OER courses. And the reason I'm saying this is because what it will do is it will create competitive advantage that you cannot match unless you are using OER courses. And a practical example of this, and just to take a step back in terms of you know, why we're all doing this, I mean, Sir John Daniel Stemenka and colleagues with their research have, you know, shown us that over the next 15 years, we are going to have to provide an additional 98 million places in post-secondary education globally. And if you do the mental math around that, it's approximately building four sizable universities of 30,000 students each, every week, for the next 15 years. For the majority of these 98 million learners, they are not going to be able to afford Traditional, the traditional model, nor are they necessarily going to be able to find places you know, within the system. It is plausible to be able to provide free learning opportunities using high quality independent study OER materials 
and provide free learning to all students worldwide using OER. And our formal sector can provide formal credit on a fee-for-service basis. And this is what we're doing with the OER university model. And if you're wondering whether this is theoretical speculation, by virtue of our networks, I can assure you that we have got accreditation in three regional jurisdictions here in the US. We've done our calculations. We will be able to provide a full degree program for under 5,000 US dollars using OER courses. So the strategic lever, if we are serious about this movement, is within our institutions to start thinking about how do we achieve formal accreditation for OER learning based solely on OER courses. And that will be the impetus for moving mainstream adoption forward, in my view. That's great, Wayne, and I think it really touches on, on how we can really flip uh, uh, the conscious and, and the knowledge about cost and about impact. So I think, uh, and this is something we discussed in our, in our group also, like where are the statistics, Where's, where are the numbers, because these are also the numbers that impact uh, uh, at the policy level, at the international level, and, and, and so on. Um, and I, I think you, you did a great work on helping us to move to the specifics. So what I would ask you all uh, to, to help us uh, develop here are the key variables, right? So you touched on some quality, cost, uh, access. So we are trying now to, to go deep from the, this broader context to the key variables. So if anybody can contribute with that. Uh, I think in, in the talk about mainstreaming, it's also um, who are we trying to help? And um, uh, Rain talked about sort of the expansion. And I think for each of us, if we sort of look at the audiences that we're reaching and the people who we're not reaching, and I think open educational resources and the, the bits of it that are free, the bits of it that fit outside curriculum, the cross between informal and informal, helps us uh, ad address people who are at the margins, uh, I'm going to use Utah's phrase from our cluster, yes, say cluster D. The, so I'd sort of like that to be up there as another variable, sort of who are at the, at the margins, um, uh, can we be addressing a sort of social inclusion aspect so that we don't go down, yeah, so it, it, we don't, so I think it was very interesting Justin showing yesterday the risk that what we do helps people who are already fine. And so deliberately looking for ways to help those people who have got problems and are outside the system. I think that's an action we could all take. Does anybody from the informal discussion or SJ <laughs> want to address that? And I'm, I'm, this, is, this is from the opposite of the formal, of the formal spectrum. Uh, I, I, just, I think that there's a, there are different time frames that that people are thinking about. And there are some discussions about what do we do in six months, what do we do in a year, what do we do for this generation of university students. Um, and I think... During the hack day. That's right. So uh, I'll, first I'll, I'll pitch the hack day. For people who, who submitted technical ideas that you think can be done really quickly, maybe some of us can work on them and produce a, an implementable spec by the end of tomorrow. But I also want to encourage people to think about what we do in a generation. In 10 years, we could make openness and open education the standard for everyone who's coming through school now. And I hear people t thinking about how you work with big established institutions, but think about how you work with children. Uh, I think there are things we can do today that set a standard for what education should be, so that in a generation, this won't be an issue. It won't be a question of, of rich versus poor. It will just be understood that education should be open in various ways. Thank you. Always inspiring. Uh, anybody wants to dialogue with the, this topic of including our generation? Or s and I also would like to call you guys to show us a little bit what you learned from the breakfast bazaar. What are the spices and you found there? How it sparked you? So, so building on your previous comments about the children, and also the badges. It strikes me as, again, going outside the traditional system, I think there are teachers in every community. And there's a big barrier to becoming a teacher with the, um, 
the cost inherent in doing so. And if there could be informal mechanisms for folks across a community and within a community to become teachers and really break, break apart this notion of traditional education, particularly in those um, less, those underdeserved populations, I think that needs to be a real focus. Any other comments? And, and I think we, we are reaching some, some, okay, let's go there. No, you can. Just really briefly, I mean, these are serious issues and obviously we're the brain trust to solve them, but we shouldn't lose fact that education should be fun and learners should want to learn. It shouldn't be something they're doing to get a job or a credential. It should be something that they do for the sake of doing it. Um, I think that is one of the biggest calls to action in my estimation, how can we make OER something that's not only policy, but uh, it's a game to some degree for the ones who need to consume it. That, that's great. And uh, I think it, it, little by little, I think there is a message emerging from here, right? We have the fun, we have the kids, we have the, a lot of, of, of things, a lot of homework we need to do on how to start for the next generation. Um, and maybe finding a common message, and that actually I heard a lot people asking, but what is the goal? What is the common goal? What is the common message here, right? And we may need to deal with that even in legal issues, right, that are starting to be raised in, in our community. So how we put all this together in a common message that actually can later spark these collaborations in, within this context. So anybody has any suggestion on, on, on that messaging? Thanks. For you, those of you that don't know me, I'm Delana Tonks. I'm the director of the Open High School of Utah, and we build our own curriculum. I think that the messaging on this is to empower teachers to meet student needs. It's as simple as that. Um, I've hired teachers from all walks of life with all sorts of backgrounds, and after their first year working with solely open educational resource curriculum, they tell me that they can't go back, that I've broken them as teachers, and that they can no longer work in a proprietary world because they're using the data to inform instruction, and they can't tweak the curriculum to meet those students' needs unless it's open. Saying we should break teachers. <laughs> <laughs> How to train the teachers through professional development, but then breaking them, right? Hi. So I think one of the questions that we're talking around is what are our definitions of success? I feel like there's lots of different goals, but nobody's actually clearly defining what are the things, what are the metrics, sorry to use that word, what are the things that are going to lead us to feel like we've accomplished what it is we've set out to do? <laughs> I thought you would put forward our goal, you know? Aren't you the queen of badges? Uh, anybody wants to address there at, or have any other experience that you want to share today during our last day? We still... Thank you, Kat. You go there? Okay. There it is. Hi. Hi, everybody. So I, I think that there are a lot of great ideas and a lot of great conversation that's, um, that's been going on. I've been popping in on some of the breakout sessions and everything. And I think um, this is a really interesting opportunity for all of us. Um, you know, on the, the first day, we talked a, a lot about our logic model and our theory of change and the, and the different pillars. And this is really informative for us also because, you know, we have these ideas and these theories of change but this is where we're reliant upon you for, as the, as the folks who are doing all of the work, about what are the things that, um, as we look through all of these, what are the main thrusts like, of, of the strategy going forward? What are the things that we're missing? What are the things that really should be strengthened going forward? What are the things that, you know, those are great things, but th we need uh, less emphasis on those so that we can put more emphasis on, on this, right? So that's what I would love to hear more of, um, because and and these more concrete ideas about, um, and I know there's a lot of different things, but if you were in 
our shoes, I would say. You know, what are the things that you would work on? And knowing that there are a limited amount of resources, what are, how can we, as a field, use uh, the resources that we have and collaborate more with each other? Because we have folks working in supply, we have working in policy and research. How can we reinforce the work that's already going on with each other, right? So um, I would encourage you to let us know, like, and keep adding the ideas on here. Is it the professional development for teachers? Is it um, more research to undergird some of the policy work that we're doing? Um, so I would encourage us to continue to talk more about those, especially in our cluster meetings, and um, make the most out of this last day together. Because going forward, we all disperse, we all do our work, um, and we get energized after a conference like this for a few weeks, and then we get busy with, with our particular uh, roles. So how can we make the most of the time that we have here together to collaborate, do the brainstorming, have the face-to-face -face meetings that make the most of the time that we have here? Thanks, Kathy. So uh, my name is Robin Steiff, and my company is Lunametrics, and we do the analytics for the OER, I guess you could call it ecosystem. Some of, I, a part of it, how if I say that, many of the grantees, though not all of them, are included. And one of the things that we work on with Kathy is trying to understand how do we get metrics, and we really do talk about metrics. And um, there is nothing that I would love more than to see a list of, you know, not all, me not all metrics are gettable, right? Like not everything is measurable even though we want to be able to. But there's nothing I would love to see more than, let me go back up for one minute. Um, so the, a lot of the metrics that we get are things that we are able to get, right? So we use proxies. Um, like time on site and a number of people and growth of the audience and because we can't get at did I, um, uh, not every OER has, did I get this in their uh, curriculum? Um, but so like as, you, every, as everyone talks, I keep thinking about, you know, one of the things that I'm personally the most interested in is, um, is um, are students doing a better job of learning um, using OERs? And on the one hand, I'm not sure how to answer the question. Um, though I have a team of people that are really good at it. On the other hand, I feel like I want to know what the questions are before I even start to think about like how to answer them. And like that's one that's on my mind, but it might not necessarily be on yours. Like Kathy just talked about policy. Like that's a whole other problem and that's probably not one for me to worry about. My, but there might be other people here. So I would just love to see, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry you took the word metrics back because I'd love to see a list of four questions, like we aren't answering these questions and we'd like to measure them. And that's all. wanted to build on that. I think one of the core things that's a little bit missing from all of these buckets is just evidence of impact. So what's driving the OER movement right now, quite frankly, I think, is not only the enthusiasm and the great innovative ideas here, but costs. I mean, it's free. And if it's free, that's a very attractive thing in a time of recession. So I think David's um, study is one of the ones that we all cite because we have a study. <laughs> and the work that, and Carnegie Mellon earlier, you know, where we were able to sort of demonstrate that it had more efficacy over time, we all use that again and again. We need a 10 cost studies and 10 impact studies. So I think this, th that's sort of the next level. And, and to Wayne's great point, I think, around credentialing, relating that then to student outcomes. So do students who actually are, are credentialed through OERs, are they more successful in life? That's what we're trying to do it for. The more we can link these things, I think, the better off we are. So to me, that's the next big move for this movement, is, is linking it to impact in a, a, both a productivity and also a effect on teaching and learning. I think this is great, and even if you say that's not related to policies, it's heavily related to policy, right? Because uh, in Brazil or in other countries, and I did, uh, we did a lot of work here in the US, uh, when you go to talk to politicians, they want to know about impact. And we just have 
uh, anecdotes, right? So in Brazil, we have a, a state that developed open test books that had a whole system of incentive to teachers, including payment and sabbaticals and working together and even traveling, you know? And, and the politicians, when they support the bill, they really mention that case over and over. Uh, but we don't have the numbers, right? Uh, we got some numbers on how econo uh, the, the resources flow into producing resources, but also the res that research is, is getting old. So I think this is a really important topic. And Cable, I saw you raising your hand. Do you want to? Well, I was just going to plus one on what Barbara said. I think she's right on the money. We need the research. And to, to put that in a little bit more general terms, I think we need to be clear about what problems are we solving, right? So, so Wayne you know, said, look, we've got a problem. We've got uh, millions of people on the planet that today have zero access to a higher education opportunity and moreover have no access to a higher education opportunity that's accredited. That, that's affordable. It's just not there. It's not going to be there given the existing systems. We need to step in and that's what OER University is trying to do. In the US, we're having conversations right now, Doug and I were talking about this last night, about uh, the common core standards in K-12. There's a massive problem that the K-12 systems are already underfunding their textbooks and their curriculum uh, refresh rates. They're 10 years behind. They're not going to be able to get to updated curriculum to meet the standards given the current models, that's a problem. That's a, that's a relatively simple problem for OER to step in and solve. David was just talking in the last session about people are out of work all over the world and there's partnerships between the National Manufacturing Association and badges and others to say people need jobs. How can we use uh, open educational resources plus badges as a, as a form of accreditation to show the employers they've got the skills so they can get jobs, right? And to the extent that uh, we, we need the research and the case studies to back that up, um, ultimately those are the kinds of stories we want to be able to tell, right? When you've got these kinds of problems, there's easy solutions. Well, and I, and I just, uh, this is uh, Doug Levin. Uh, I, I think we just want to be a little bit careful about not falling into a trap that there's, uh, that OER solves one problem. Um, I think it probably solves multiple uh, problems. And even in the t short time that I've been with the community, I've seen tremendous innovation. And in two, four years from now, I expect to see a lot more. Um, one of the challenges, right, with you know, sort of, uh, we need to be mindful uh, in, in uh, as we get much sharper about what success looks like and how we know it when we get there, that we also uh, allow the community the opportunity to uh, go after new problems that we didn't actually realize uh, were necessarily there we could solve. So, so another sort of a, a problem, for instance, that I've been thinking a lot about, frankly, is just around teacher uh, professionalism, teacher capacity, you know, quality teaching. So one of the best ways, uh, some of the, one of the best forms of professional development, it seems to me, would actually to have some agency, if maybe not in the development of your own curriculum, as I'm thinking in the US, I'm not sure it's realistic to think three million teachers are each going to develop their own curriculum every year, and every five years you have a whole new crop. Um, but they can be modifying it, they can be improving it, they can be um, customizing it to meet the needs of their students. Right now they have no agency whatsoever in the U.S. in the K-12 context, even in the selection of materials that they get in, in many places. Um, so uh, the fact that if there were OER materials available, this could be among the best professional development opportunities they could ever have, um, right? So, and that solves um, a problem, potentially a problem, uh, about uh, teacher quality, which is different, and it is related to student uh, learning ultimately. I think there's a strong case to be made um, that way. And then finally, uh, an unrelated comment um, that I do worry about that is an issue for us in general. Um, in thinking about what success is, um, we need to think about sustainability. You know, we celebrate our wins. It's important to celebrate our wins when we have them. But this is a process, and this is sort of a forevermore and always, and we'll continue to need to be uh, looked at. Implementation needs to be good. Every time we, we stumble, and we will continue to stumble, um, it will be held against us if we don't um, uh, learn from those mistakes and be honest with ourselves, at least in this room, right, about 
what success really means and, and to celebrate those, but also to be really clear-eyed that, you know, this policy win was a great press release, but six months later, things didn't work out the way that we had hoped. Uh, this is Steve Mitchley. I, um, I'll bring up a topic which may not be of interest to everyone in the room, but relates what you could call operating models, to put it in the most generic terms. Business models would be in the commercialization terms. And just to speak to the notion that there's conversations about replacing existing curricular materials, curricular systems, professional development. Uh, and I think we have to ask ourselves the questions of, are we producing OER materials that are designed to replace those materials within the existing business models? So instead of buying a textbook, you're going to buy this, and it's cheaper or free, or are we talking about creating alternative business models, different ways of integrating the things we create into the educational system? And I think that we talk past each other a lot. I hear this in this conference and others dodging that question, which is there's a commercialization opportunity to sell something in the existing market channel that the publishers have created and defended or there's an alternative to try to disrupt and dismantle that and replace it with something else. But if we don't have a clear vision of what that alternative is, then I think we default to a, 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 a no man's land between these two things where we have all this great stuff, but we're not trying to sell it in the existing market, but we're not actually creating an alternative market channel. We're just creating a new set of materials that through some miracle of the internet plus populism plus collaboration will emerge something. But I think the publishers have seen that coming before and are fully equipped to, to manage that sort of intrusion into their industry. So I, I would just encourage us to not, in terms of the hard problems, not just talking about the creation of resources or even the dissemination or availability of resources, but the actual business models, the operating business models. Are we going to, as an industry, hire salespeople and bid on RFPs and sell these things down that path, or are we going to pay lobbyists and get active in changing the rules that make that the only viable road in, at least within the US? So I may be wrong about all those things I'm saying, but I want to challenge the, the, the community to, if that is wrong, to say why it is wrong. So I just um when I open for our final comment, uh, we have hit our hour and we have some comments also from Rob Ferris. So any final comment? It's been great to be here and as I've been listening to and I talked to my other group about open education resources. This is really about open education connections. A lot of people have said, well, K-12 teachers don't get it. They're working like crazy and they do get it but they don't really have a direction to go and it's hard to find things. And you know, we're not talking about building the network. You're just talking about giving teachers what they already have. We have videos, we have books. The publishers will not connect the teachers and the learners around a textbook. You are open and you can and whoever builds the Facebook for education that's gonna be worldwide is going to own education. You have the opportunity. I feel like you're trying to be publishers you are publishers, but what publishers are forgetting is that they should be connectors. They're forgetting what they're doing. We are not consumers. We are connectors, and we will connect with or without publishers, and we will connect with or without open education. But to me, that is the opportunity you have. If you can pull us in your network, get us sharing with each other, then you are sustainable because you do have the network. Thank you. Um, so I really see here, it, it feels that we are in a cycle, right? If we don't train our teachers and if we don't involve the students, we will not ask, uh, uh, develop the skills we need even to be innov innovative about business models, right? We, we have to think about this generation, how we create how we, we help people to be creative and to really engage in innovation and disruption and, and how we all can converge thinking about like 10 years from now, what is the generation we, we are expecting and what, are, what, are the role, what is the role of ev each one of us here in this room. So I think it, it, we really f uh, 
end up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a cycle here uh, uh, in terms of what comes first. So I really invite you all to, to keep collaborating and to keep helping us setting these research questions and setting uh, the five, ten years of uh, helping Helich to set that strategy moving forward. They are asking that help. So I think it's a great opportunity for all of us. I would like to pass the word for Rob Ferris Thanks. from Berkman now. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you all for your ideas and participation. Great morning. I want to explain to you what you're going to do next. Please listen carefully because it's a little bit complicated. And it's this point in the conference where things could really go terribly, terribly wrong. Um, <laughs> there's three things you need to do in the next hour and 13 minutes, maybe 12 minutes. Uh, you need to reconvene with your cluster groups and get your interventions into the reporting template. You need to find your way to the next venue, which is Austin Hall, and you need to eat lunch, all right? All equally important. Um, what we're gonna suggest is that you find your clusters now. Um, if it helps you to organize, I would suggest A, B, C, D here, E, F, G, H here, I, J, K, L, M, and everybody else down there. Um, once you find your clusters, you probably want to come up with a, an, a, a plan for getting your interventions into the template so that we can capture them, reproduce them, and your great ideas aren't lost forever and uh, to, the, to the irreparable harm to the hundreds of millions of students around the world. Um, if you need help with the uh, reporting template, uh, let us know. It should be pretty straightforward. You're checking boxes throughout but uh, the link is in your wiki there. So that's number one. Number two, uh, around 11.45, we're gonna start um, shepherding people over to Austin Hall. It is a uh, stone uh, red building. It's a couple minutes that way, walk south through the yard. You've been that way already. Um, if you don't get lost, it'll only take you a couple minutes to get there. That's number two. Uh, what was number three? Ah, your lunch will be there waiting for you. So find your lunch and please do eat it and enjoy. Jonathan Zittrain is starting the afternoon session at 1245. He's a great speaker, great session, so you don't want to miss that. Um, that is there. Everything is in Austin. So you're going to meet your cluster here, come up with a plan, take everything you own, walk to Austin Hall, eat lunch, Finish everything you need to do by 12.45, then Jonathan's a train will start the afternoon there. 